about the God of Glen Ferry Road, I'm really trying to make an invitation to people to think about the specific little corners of their own experience which God haunts and in which God makes a home. And is the God of Glen Ferry Road very different from the God, for example, of Williamstown Road? I'm not sure. I think the question is another one. The question is about belonging and identity and the kind of spiritual experience that comes from that. If you think back to Glen Ferry Road in 1911, a hundred years ago, it's interesting to think actually how much the same it is. Glen Ferry Road began as a bit of a track down from Burwood Road, which was the major thoroughfare leaving out of town. But in the 1840s, there was a little farm down on Gardens Creek called Glen Ferry. And Glen Ferry Road was the track that came from Burwood Road down to that farm. I presume this was before the Monash Freeway went over the top of it. But by 1911, a lot of uh, Glen Ferry Road is basically as it is now. It's crossed by three train lines. They were all there. There were two very significant town halls, Malvern and Hawthorne. They were there. There were a number of churches, which is still there. Schools, still there. St. Kevin's wasn't here yet, Stephen, but we were on our way. But a good number of the schools were, and the mansions, the big houses, and I went to the library and looked at a picture of Glen Ferry Road Hawthorne in 1911. And the streetscape is basically the same. It is remarkable that this part of the world, at least in its physical character, has such stability. And that is indeed a hallmark, I suppose, of the middle class of Melbourne. That this part of the world owes its identity to the boom the 1880s, and the people who created this world had a strong sense that they were creating something to last, and something in which the public had a lot of space. So if you think back again to the town halls, and to the schools and the churches, we are talking about major investment in a sense of community, identity, substance. I've been talking this week at school with students about the legacy of Steve Jobs. And I'm teaching boys in year 10 and 11 whose world was very, very much shaped by the inventions of Steve Jobs or his company at least in the last 10 years. I'm thinking of the iPod, the iPhone, the iPad. And it was just interesting to reflect upon these things with the boys. And the sense of isolation that all these inventions can uh, help to create. I'm not saying that they create them, but they can actually. Because the iPod, the iPhone, and the iPad are all things that you use on your own. Jobs has been compared in the last week or so with Thomas Edison. And Edison's a person that I've always found fascinating. And there are some similarities. They're both extremely ruthless. They both actually made a fortune out of developing ideas that other people actually came up with, but they were the sort of front person. Some similarities. They both uh, were extremely driven. But Edison's vision which coincides with the time that the suburbs of Melbourne were being rolled out, he really believed in things that people would use as a group. Talking about the phonograph, the mimeograph, which is the first duplicating machine, the movie projector, and electric light. His gift of electric light to public places by creating a system that actually made it work. Edison had a strong sense of doing things for the human family. The whole story of Jobs is so different. The entrepreneur as an individual, the invention of things which are absolutely not the Wii Pod, the Wii Phone, and the Wii Pad, they are the iPod, the iPhone, the iPad. And the impact that these have on 
I said to the boys in both year 10 and 11, think back to 2001, which is the year both of September 11 and of the iPod. Who was going to have more impact on the future, Osama bin Laden or Steve Jobs? And it was really good, a nice piece of mental chewing gum, so we all got to work on this. And what we got to in the end was actually the iPod owed some of its success to the world created or uh, created to some extent by Osama bin Laden because it actually banks on the world being a kind of hostile place where there is fear, suspicion, uncertainty that actually you can plug in and you've got your whole world with you in that little gadget which you can use in isolation. Now I don't want to be a sour person and poo-poo these things, I use them myself, I must say, and find them uh, extremely handy. But actually, when we talk about the God of Glenferry Road, we have to think of the dangers of bringing people up when they belong to no place in particular. When their culture comes to them from every which way, that it's all there on YouTube, Facebook, could be anywhere, any time of the day. And yet we know it's the wisdom of the ages that people's sense of well-being and God comes from their very definite kinds of belonging. And really, kids' sense of God comes from learning to pray in the same place, in their beds at night, going to the same church or ch few small number of churches, week in, week out, praying in their classroom, that these familiar places actually lead to a deep, deep sense of God. I want to finish just with one thing which comes from home. My children, um, I've got six-year-old twins in prep. Prep is a wonderful year. We've had a great year this year. And my, our eight-year-old is in grade two. And so I, the preppies have been listening to the Harry Potter story for the first time this year, the first one. And um, I must say, those Harry Potter books, I do love them, and I love what they've done for the world. And so Benny, who's eight, is hearing the first Harry Potter book for the second time, and he loves it. And he said to me afterwards, he said, you know, Dad, how come you only get good and evil in stories? And I said, what do you think, Benny? He said, look, you only get good and evil in stories like Harry Potter or Star Wars, but you, you don't get good and evil in real life. And I said, oh, Benny, I, I, I couldn't quite understand what he was getting at, and I thought about it. I said, Benny, he said, Daddy, in real life, all you get are good things and bad things, but you don't get good and evil. And here is somebody aged eight whose world is already, this is my interpretation, that that sense of the umbrella narrative, the big ideas of good and evil with capital G and capital E, they're starting not to work for him. That actually his world is becoming a jumbled up series of good things and bad things. And really, our challenge with a young man like that, you know, love to death and the boys I teach, is to provide something like a road which holds it all together. A place of belonging, a bit like Glen Prairie Road, the way it holds together so much experience both through time and through place.